Hello and welcome to the section on constant predictors. Now the idea of this section is to explore the simplest possible predictor. And that's the constant predictor. What constant means here is that instead of g theta of x depending on x, g theta of x totally ignores x. It always returns the same y hat, the same prediction. And so we'll just call that theta. And that will be the parameter that determines the predictor and the parameter that therefore determines the prediction. And it will be a vector in Rm. The purpose of looking at such a simple predictor is that it gives us an understanding of what the loss means. And we will look at a number of different losses and be able to get some understanding of what it means to have a prediction that minimizes those particular losses. Another way to think about what we're doing in this section is we're looking at a linear regression model where the features are the simplest possible features. Every data element is just given feature phi of u is equal to 1, which is nice. It doesn't depend on u. And of course, we don't even need u. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use ERM, empirical risk minimization, to fit theta to the data. And because there's no sensitivity, we're going to have no need for regularization. The predictor is completely insensitive. So as we'll see, different losses lead to different predictors. So we're going to have data, y1 through yn. Each one of those y's will be either a scalar or a vector in Rm. And we'll have a loss function, which will take two y's, a y hat and a y, and return us a real number. Um, and I think in every one of the predictors we analyze today, we're going to have m is equal to 1. So all of the y's will in fact be a scalar. Let me write that on the slide. m is equal to 1. So our, our loss function, L of y hat and y, quantifies how badly y hat approximates y. And we've seen a few different losses so far in this course. Um, so for scalar y, We've seen the quadratic loss, which is y hat minus y squared. We've seen the absolute loss, which is the absolute value of y hat minus y. And we've seen the fractional loss, which is the max of y hat over y minus 1 and y over y hat minus 1. And that's the percentage error once we scale it by 100. Of course, the fractional loss only applies when both y and y hat are positive numbers. Um, and if we were looking at m greater than 1, when we had a vector y, we might look at the quadratic loss as the norm squared of y hat minus y. So we're going to choose now a predictor with no data. So our predictor just returns theta. And we're going to choose the theta to minimize the empirical risk. And that's going to be the average of the loss of theta and yi, averaged over all the data elements, yi for i is 1 up to n. And we will we'll solve it in these particular cases and in some other cases as well. And um, we'll see that the result that you get is actually very interpretable. Now, one of the features of losses that make them tractable, that make them make them make it possible for us to determine either analytically or numerically exactly what the optimal theta is, is convexity. So here we have a function f mapping from R k to the real numbers. So this is a real valued function on a k-dimensional Euclidean space. And such functions we're going to call convex if they satisfy the following inequality. 
And that is that for all points w and z in Rk, and for all alpha in the interval 0 to 1, if we evaluate f at alpha w plus 1 minus alpha z, that's less than or equal to alpha times f of w plus 1 minus alpha times f of z. Now this inequality, this uh, expression, has a nice meaning. Let's look at it. Here we have two points, w and z, and they live in a k-dimensional space. And what this, this, light, this expression does, alpha w plus 1 minus alpha d, z, is it's a parameterization of the line segment connecting z to w. And when alpha is 0, well then, alpha w plus 1 minus alpha z is just z. When alpha is 1, it's just w. When alpha is a quarter, we find that alpha w plus 1 minus alpha z is exactly one quarter of the way along the line from z to w. So this expression, alpha w plus 1 minus alpha z, is called a convex combination of w and z, and it's simply a way of parameterizing the line segment between two points. On the right-hand side of this expression, you'll notice we have a very similar convex combination, but this is of two real numbers, f of w and f of z. And so we're parameterizing the line segment in one dimension from f of w to f of z. Now what this means is the following. If my point w is, say, at point 1, and my point z is, say, at point 8, well then f of w is somewhere over here, and f of z is somewhere over here. And this inequality means that this line segment lies above the function. And if for any two points that I pick, z and w, the line segment joining the corresponding points on the curve lies above the curve itself, then such a function is called convex. Over here on the right we see an example where that fails. Here are two points. Here is the line segment. We can see that it falls underneath the graph of the function. And so this is not a convex function. So this means that the function has to curve upwards. Another way to say that it has positive curvature. It has to curve upwards everywhere. Now, if we have a differentiable function, well, convexity can be expressed in terms of the curvature directly. The curvature of a differentiable function is the second derivative. And so this expression is exactly equivalent to the requirement that the second derivative of f at all points w has to be greater than or equal to zero. And there's another way of characterizing it as well, and that is to look at the first derivative of the function f. And a function is convex if and only if its first derivative is non-decreasing. In other words, as you increase w, then the gradient of f can't decrease. That's true. Those two conditions for derivatives uh, are true for functions from the reals to the reals.
and in particular the second condition that the second derivative has to be non-negative can be generalized in a straightforward way to functions on RK but we won't need that here. It's also worth pointing out that the notion of convexity defined by this inequality doesn't have any requirements that the function be differentiable and it's quite reasonable to look at functions which have kinks in them and which are so this is a function which is which is linear on a region linear on another region and then has a curve for the third part and that's still a convex function it's simply not differentiable at this point or at this point. Now, convexity has a, is a very important property when one is trying to solve minimization problems or more general optimization problems. And this is for this following property that if I've got a differentiable function, then a point w is the minimum of that function if and only if the gradient of f at w is equal to zero. And the, when you read this expression, it's tempting to confuse this with similar expressions that you've seen before in your calculus class, where one is trying to find the minimum or the maximum of a function and one looks for stationary points. Now, the trouble with stationary points is that they might be a minimum, they might be a local minimum, they might be a local maximum, or they might be a saddle point or something else in higher dimensions. Here, this is not just a local minimum. This is a global minimum. This is the true meaning of the word minimize, not the colloquial meaning of the word minimize. I mean, this is W that actually finds the global minimum of the function f. And so one can find the global minimum simply by looking for points where the derivative is zero. Now, for convex functions on the reals, so that is one-dimensional convex functions, we can characterize explicitly conditions under which we have a minimum point. Now let's look at that. Let me plot such a function. And here I have a function which has a point which is not differentiable, but yet that point is clearly the minimum. Now I can't simply take the derivative because the function is not differentiable there. However, for a convex function, there's always a left-hand derivative and a right-hand derivative. What that means is that if I look at this point w, there's a slope to the right and a slope to the left. And this slope to the left is labeled f dash minus of w, and this slope to the right is labeled f dash plus of w. They're defined in a way very similar to the way we usually define derivatives. This left-hand slope is the limit as t tends to zero of the slope f of w plus t minus f of w divided by t, but we're allowed to take the limit only over negative t. And similarly, the right-hand slope is a limit taken only over positive t. Now, in terms of these two derivatives, the left-hand and the right-hand derivative, w is a minimum if and only if the left-hand derivative is less than or equal to zero and the right-hand derivative is greater than or equal to zero. Even if f is not differentiable, we will have both a left-hand derivative and a right-hand derivative. And so this is a condition we can use for any convex function f. If the function is derivative, if the function is differentiable, well then its left-hand derivative and its right-hand derivative will both be the same the slope will be the same whether we approach the point from the left-hand side or from the right-hand side. And both of these will equal the usual derivative. 
Uh, for a simple example, we might look at the absolute value function. The absolute value function looks like that. And we can see that if I look at the point w is equal to zero, well then f dash minus of zero is minus one, and f dash plus of zero is one. Clearly the left hand derivative is, neg is negative and the, left and the right hand derivative is positive, and therefore w is a minimum. Now for many of the loss functions of interest in machine learning, the loss function itself is a convex function of the prediction y hat. Certainly the ones we saw on the previous two slides, all of those loss functions are convex in the prediction. It's also true that if you take a convex function and another convex function and add them up, well then the, the sum of those two convex functions is itself convex. And if I scale a convex function by a positive number, well then I get another convex function. And as a result, I can take the average of all of the convex functions in the empirical risk, L of theta, and get another convex function. So the empirical risk is a convex function of theta. And so by using the optimality conditions on the previous slide, we can characterize exactly when theta minimizes the empirical risk. All we have to do is look at the left-hand derivative and the right-hand derivative and check whether they have the appropriate sign and that will tell us when theta is a minimum. So first let's look at the simplest case the case of square loss. Of course, this function is convex, but it's also differentiable. Then the loss L of y hat and y is the norm of y hat minus y squared. In the case of a scalar y and y hat, that's just the square of y hat minus y. And the empirical risk is just the mean square error. One over n, the sum over i, theta minus y i squared because here we have constant predictor g theta of x is just equal to theta. Now this is a simple least squares problem. We can simply differentiate the objective with respect to theta, and we'll find that the optimal theta is 1 on n times the sum over i of yi, which is the average of the yi's. This is uh, the best constant predictor when we're using the square loss. It's the average or the mean of the data. The resulting mean square error is the variance of the data. Here's an example. Here I have a bunch of data points. One here, one here, one here and uh, the mean of those data points is given by this red line, which is about 1.12, something like that. If I plot the loss function as a function of theta, this is this curve here, and the minimum of that curve is exactly at the mean. This loss function is a sum of, is an average of the square loss applied to each of those different points. So we've actually constructed this loss function by taking 1 on n times the sum of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 square functions, each of the form theta minus yi squared. Now let's look at the absolute loss case. Here we have the, the loss function L of y hat y 
is the absolute value of y hat minus y. And so the empirical risk is the mean absolute error. Now for this, we've got uh, an empirical risk, which is the average of a bunch of absolute value functions. It's certainly a convex function because the loss, the absolute value of y hat minus y is convex in y hat. It's piecewise linear, but it's not smooth. It's not differentiable at every point. It has kink points at the data values. And we will actually see that the theta that optimizes this empirical risk, the, minim the theta that minimizes the empirical risk, is the median of the data. And this is a very reasonable way of making an approximation of the data. So here, it's the same set of data points. And what we can see is that this function is actually piecewise linear. If we look at these points right here, these are kink points. Let me make those a little bigger. These are kink points in the graph. Between those points, the graph is a straight line, and at those points, there's an abrupt change in the derivative of the function. The, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven data points, and so if we sort those data points, the median is the fourth data point. It has three points to the left and three points to the right, and that gives us this median value right there, which is precisely the value which minimizes the empirical risk. So let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. We want to actually, first of all, define the median. And that's not quite as straightforward as it at first appears. Um, if we have an odd number of data points, well, then the median is the middle point. If we have an even number of data points, well, then we have to allow ourselves the possibility that any to any point which is which has half of the data points to the left and half of the data points to the right might be reasonably considered a median. Let's first of all write that down mathematically and then um, uh, do the analysis. So the simplest, uh, let's look at an example first. Suppose we have uh, data y1 through yn. Uh, if n is odd, then the median is simply the middle point, which is y n plus 1 over 2. And that's completely well defined. If n is even, well, then we say theta is a median if theta is anywhere between y n on 2 and y n on 2 plus 1. The median is not unique. So if I have these four data points, minus 3.3, minus 1.7, 0 0.4, and well, there's the three data points, and the median is just the middle one, which is minus 1.7. If I have four data points, so I add a new data point at 4.9, well then the median is any number between minus 1.7 and 0 0.4. Now to characterize the median precisely, we will define two quantities. Uh, the first of which is going to be called n1, and that's a function of theta, and it is the number of data points strictly less than theta. And the second one is n2, it's also a function of theta, it's the number of data points strictly greater than theta. And then theta is a median of the data if n1 divided by n, the fraction of data points strictly less than theta, is less than or equal to half, and n2 divided by n, the fraction of data points strictly greater than theta, 
is also less than or equal to one half. Now, if theta is not equal to a data point, then the number of data points strictly less than theta and the number of data points strictly greater than theta are actually related, of course. They add up. n1 plus n2 is going to add up to n. And so both of these conditions collapse now to one condition, which is just that n1 divided by n is a half. The number of data points less than theta is a half implies that the number of data points greater than theta is a half. If theta is equal to a data point, well then we need two conditions, not just one condition to characterize the median, because there may be a certain number of data points equal to the value of theta. Now we can use this characterization in order to show that the median, or a median, because the median is in general not unique, minimizes the empirical risk when we're using the absolute loss. And it is the case that there may be more than one minimizer of the risk, and that every one of those risks, those minimizers, is a median. And conversely, that you pick any median of the data, and that will be a minimizer of the risk. How do we see this? Well, let's first of all just assume the data is sorted. So we'll have y1 less than or equal to y2 all the way up to yn. Of course, that doesn't make any difference to the problem. It doesn't change the empirical risk because the empirical risk is just the average of the loss evaluated at those points. So we can order them any way we want to. Let's evaluate the empirical risk. The empirical risk is the sum over the data of the absolute value of theta minus yi, all divided by 1 on n. For those data points for which theta is less than yi, that is abs the absolute value of theta minus yi is minus theta minus yi. For those data points where theta is greater than yi, the absolute value of theta minus yi is just theta minus yi. So we'll split up that sum into those two categories. So first of all, we sum over the points for which yi is less than theta. Those are the first n1 data points. And then we sum over the points for which yi is greater than theta, and those are the last n2 data points. There may be some other data points at which theta is equal to yi. Uh, those contribute zero because the loss at those points is zero, and so they don't enter into this sum. If there aren't any such data points, theta is not equal to a data value, well, we can differentiate this sum. Differentiating this with respect to theta is easy. We get n1 on n minus n2 on n. Um, however, we actually need to find the minimum point. And it may be that the minimum point of this function L of theta is at a kink point, at a point where the function is not differentiable. And that may or may not be the case. We may be in the case where the function looks like this, in which case the minimum is any point here, or we may be in the case where the function has a, a kink in it, in which case the minimum is there. Now, if we're at a point, if we're at the case where there's a kink in the function and the minimum is at the kink, well, now we can't simply di differentiate L of theta. And so what we need to do is look at the left-hand and right-hand derivatives. To do this, we will assume, first of all, that theta is just to the left of a data point. 
Now, when, when theta is just to the left of a data point, well, suddenly there's no possibility that there's a data point at theta, and so n1 and n2 are related because n1 plus n2 equals n. And so this, I can evaluate this expression knowing that n2 is equal to n minus n1, and then I can differentiate it. And when I do that, I end up with this expression right here for L dash minus of theta. And I can do exactly the same thing when I'm looking at the right-hand derivative. And when I look at the right-hand derivative, I can substitute in again n1 plus n2 is equal to n because I know theta is not at a data point. And here we've chosen to eliminate n1 rather than eliminating n2, and so we get a slightly different expression for L dash, L dash plus. Now theta is optimal means that L dash minus of theta is less than or equal to zero, and L dash plus of theta is greater than or equal to zero. And those two conditions come immediately from here. Uh, 2n1 on n minus 1 is less than or equal to 0, means n1 on n is less than or equal to a half. Conversely, the right-hand condition becomes n2 on n is less than or equal to a half. And those are the precise conditions under which theta is the median. And so we've shown that theta is the median is equivalent to theta minimizing the empirical risk. So now I want to turn to a different loss function, and we're going to construct it using this function, the tilted absolute value function. And what it is, is it's a parameterized family of functions. It has a parameter tau in it, which must be between 0 and 1. And then it gives it a penalty function. We will use it to penalize the difference between the prediction y hat and the actual y. So u here corresponds to y hat minus y. And we're going to have p of u be either minus tau times u when u is less than 0, or 1 minus tau times u when u is greater than or equal to 0. And it is exactly what the name suggests. When tau is a half, it's like a, an absolute value function, just scaled. So it's equal to 1 half the absolute value function. If we increase tau, then we see that it tilts, and it is larger for negative u than for positive u. And if we decrease tau, then it tilts the other way, and it becomes larger for positive u than for negative u. And there's a nice expression for it, which is explicit in voice. The case is, it's a half minus tau times u plus one half multiplied by the absolute value of u. Now, if we use it as a loss function, well, then we've got the tilted absolute loss, which is the loss of y hat y is p tau of y hat minus y. And so the risk will be the average tilted absolute loss. Now, this function, L of theta, the risk, is convex, and it's piecewise linear because the tilted absolute loss is a convex piecewise linear function of y hat. And when we take the average of such functions, we get another one. And it turns out that it has kink points at the data, y1 to yn. Now, if tau is less than a half, well, that means that when y hat is less than y, we are going to have a small value of the penalty function compared to when y hat is greater than y. And so it's going to be worse to overestimate than to underestimate. We're going to prefer to make underestimates. For tau greater than a half, we prefer to overestimate, and it's worse to underestimate. And so there are situations where one would prefer to make an overestimate than an underestimate. If we're measuring the quantity of something dangerous, 
we'd prefer to overestimate that quantity rather than underestimate that quantity. And so we'll see that theta is optimal if it's a tau quantile of the data. And that means that roughly a fraction of the y's less than theta is around tau. So here's the empirical risk. We have here a collection of data points. And the risk function has kinks in it directly above the data points. And in between those data points, it is piecewise, it is linear. And uh, so these segments joining the data points are straight lines. And the optimal theta, it's, it's right here at a data point. It's at uh, point 0.5. And this is where tau is 0.25, and we can see that this loss function is going to increase like this or get steeper. And this loss function actually turns out doesn't get any steeper at all. And uh, because we, these are the only data points that we have, in fact, we know that this loss function continues straight and this loss function continues straight. And we can see that there's a penalty for underestimating and a penalty for overestimating and the penalty for overestimating is greater than the penalty for underestimating. So just like we did for the medians we need to define carefully what a tau quantile is and then we'll see that the tau quantiles are the things that minimize the empirical risk. So for tau between 0 and 1 Theta is a tau quantile if n1 on n is less than or equal to tau is less than or equal to 1 minus n2 on n. So remember n1 is the number of data points strictly less than theta. So n1 on n is the fraction of the data less than theta. And n2 on n is the fraction of the data greater than theta. And so 1 minus n2 on n is the fraction of the data less than or equal to the predictor y hat, or theta. Now, if theta doesn't equal any of the data points, well, then n1 and n2 are related, because n1 plus n2 is then going to equal n. And so these two inequalities reduce to one inequality. And uh, to, actually, they reduce to an equation, because we have n1 on n is going to be less than or equal to theta, and the other inequality is going to reduce to n1 on n is greater is less than or equal is greater than or equal to tau. So we'll have two inequalities of the opposite sign. And as a result, the those two inequalities boil down to tau is n1 on n. The fraction of data points less than theta is equal to tau. If you're at a data point, then you have to be careful to account for the number of data points equal to theta. Uh, quantiles have names. Uh, one of them we've seen already when tau is a half is the median. Another one are the quartiles. Tau is a quarter, tau is a half, tau is 0.75. The deciles, tau is 0.1 through 0.9. And the percentiles. Let's look at some examples of quantiles. Here we have a plot. On the left, we see the tau quantiles. And on the horizontal axis, we see tau. We've got five data points, four, seven, seven, eight, and nine. Let's just mark those. Four, seven, seven, eight, and nine. And if we pick a tau of 0 0.1, then there's a unique quantile. Theta is equal to 4. If we pick a tau of 0 0.2, then there's a range 
of quantiles between 4 and 7. Any number between 4 and 7 is a point 0.2 quantile. Here at point 0.5, the corresponding 0 0.5 quantile is 7. Now, the tau quantile minimizes the empirical risk when you have tilted absolute loss. And this is exactly like the argument we used in the case of the median. Let's say this precisely. We'll say that theta minimizes the empirical risk if and only if it's one of the tau quantiles. And here the empirical risk is defined with the tilted absolute loss, and the tilted absolute loss has parameter tau in it. And the argument goes exactly the same way. We assume the data is sorted, and then the loss has n terms in it. Each one has the form p tau theta minus yi. But those expressions for p tau depend on whether theta is less than yi or theta is greater than yi. And so we split that sum up into terms for which theta is less than yi and the terms for which theta is greater than yi. Now, if theta is not equal to a data value, we can just immediately differentiate this um, with respect to theta. Uh, and we find this nice expression. We can uh, 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 evaluate this to find out whether or not we're at a point where theta is uh, L dash of theta is zero. But the, if we're looking to check whether or not we have a minimum, we know that this function L is not differentiable, and so that's not a sufficient test for minima, for a theta being optimal. Instead, we need to look at the left and the right derivatives. And we do the same trick as before. We consider a point, and in order to evaluate uh, the derivative, the left-hand derivative, we'll evaluate the left-hand derivative at a point theta slightly to the left of the point. If we move slightly left of the point, then n1 doesn't change, but n2 does, because n2 increases by the number of points actually at that minimum. And so we eliminate n2 from the equation, since we know that n1 plus n2 is equal to n. And that gives us this expression here for L dash prime of theta, L dash minus of theta, to evaluate the right-hand derivative, we move slightly to the right. When we move slightly to the right, we know uh, uh, we know again we uh, we know n two, but we don't know n one because n one depends on the number of points at the minimum, and so we eliminate n one since we know n one plus n two is n, and we get a nice expression for. L dash plus of theta. Then to check for optimality, we have to check that L dash minus of theta is less than or equal to zero, and L dash plus of theta is greater than or equal to zero, which gives us the inequalities that define the median. Let's look at one more case. This is the fractional loss case. Now the fractional loss is this loss right here. The loss of y hat y is the maximum of y hat divided by y minus 1 and y divided by y hat minus 1, which has this nice expression as the exponential of the absolute value of the difference between the logarithms minus 1. And it's this function. It's curved. Here we are in the case where y is 2 and we're looking at y hat. If y is Two and y hat is two and a half, well, then y hat is 25% more than y. If y is two and we're looking at uh, a y hat of one, well, uh, then we have that y is 100% more than y hat. And obviously, as y hat tends to zero, the percentage more 
that y is than y hat is going to tend to infinity. And the empirical risk is therefore the average of the fractional loss. Uh, this is a convex function because the fractional loss is convex, as we can see from the plot. And we are going to call the theta that minimizes L of theta the fractional middle of y1 to yn. And that's actually not a standard term, but it's convenient. Uh, this is a plot of the empirical risk as a function of theta. Uh, there are, um, in fact, kinks in this plot. They can be quite hard to see, but they lie exactly above the data, right here, and here, and here. But the function is not piecewise linear. Between any two kinks, it is curved. The data is right here, and we can see that there is a minimum, this is the fractional middle, that's marked in red, that is, uh, doesn't occur at a data point. And this segment right here is actually a curved segment that has a minimum right there. And we go through exactly the same kind of analysis as before. We split the data into data points less than theta and data points greater than theta. That gives us two sums. For one of the sums, we end up with one of the expressions in the fractional loss. And for the other sum, we end up with the other expression in the fractional loss. We can collect all the terms involving one at the beginning, and so then we'll end up with an expression like this. Now, if we're at a theta between two particular data points, yk and yk plus one, then L dash of theta is easy to evaluate. We simply look at this expression we have, differentiate it with respect to theta, and we have this expression right here. Now, because the empirical risk is convex, then the gradient is going to be an increasing function of theta. And all we need to do to find the minimum is to find out where the gradient crosses zero. So we go through all the data points one at a time, looking at k, till we find, uh, uh, till we find one of the k's such that when we evaluate this derivative here, at the beginning of the interval, at yk, we have a derivative which is less than or equal to zero. And when we evaluate that derivative at the other end of the interval, at yk plus one, we have a derivative which is greater than or equal to zero. Then we found the interval in which the optimal theta lies. And then we can look at that derivative and set it to zero and solve to find the corresponding theta. And that gives us this nice expression right here for the optimal theta. So the procedure to find that theta is first we have to find k. We have to find k such that this expression here is uh, less than or equal to zero when we evaluate it at theta is yk, and it's greater than or equal to zero when we evaluate it at theta is yk plus one. And then we just use this formula to give us the optimal theta. Let's summarize. The simplest predictor is a constant. It's y hat is theta. Different losses give you different thetas um, when you apply empirical risk minimization. And for some common losses, you actually get well-known predictors. The square loss, the predictor is the mean. The absolute loss gives you the median, and the tilted absolute loss gives you the quantile. It's worth also me pointing out at this point that even though this section had quite a lot of algebra and technicalities in it, the technicalities in the algebra don't really matter. What matters here is the interpretation of the losses and the interpretation of the results that they give you. You should know that when you're going to do machine learning with a square loss, you're going to get an answer 
which corresponds to the mean. And if you do use the absolute loss, you're going to get something corresponding to the median and have some intuition about how those things behave. In particular, we know that the median is kind of insensitive to the position of outliers, whereas the mean is very sensitive to the position of outliers. Um, the tilted absolute loss is very useful because very often we really do want an estimate which is preferentially underestimating or preferentially overestimating the true Y.